Hi, this is Roger from Kanker Labs with a, another episode of our M Show video series about what every maker should have one of. Now you will say, if you can read it in German, why does every maker have to have a rubidium frequency standard? Well, of course not everyone, but most of the electronics hobbyists I know they also are uh, very interested in test and measurement gear and of course all or most of us do have a good frequency counter but you always have the problem how to adjust your frequency counter or the crystal inside the frequency counter and you might think well is it really necessary to use a rubidium frequency standard well, in the days when our st I started electronics, they uh, invented strange ways to get a um, atomic clock controlled frequency signal. For example, the multiplex 19 kilohertz tone that is used in FM stereo radios in Germany is by the public broadcast radios, in fact, controlled by an atomic clock. So one way in times long gone was to use the 19 kilohertz multiplex tone, a pilot tone as it is called in Germany, to get a very stable reference frequency. Another way was to use the frequency of AM transmitters, all German long and medium wave AM transmitters also again from the public broadcast services. The frequency was uh, controlled also by atomic clocks, uh, by cesium standard clocks, but they all have switched off in the meantime. So there is no longer any uh, German public AM radio available, at least not over the air. And what else did they use? The a 15.625 kilohertz uh, used in uh, color TV for the deviation of the uh, of the line frequency that was also controlled um, by atomic clocks and there were a lot of different ways to get a standard frequency out of publicly available signals uh, but that was all not very well very usable uh, and rubidium frequency standards were in the days when I started in, in the electronics hobby they were nearly unavailable for for prices below 10,000 uh, euros or dollars but that has changed we will later take a look in inside you get these for around or I've got mine a few years ago for around 100 bucks on eBay, of course used, uh, they are used in um, GSM mobile services in the little um, towers that serve as a repeater for the GSM uh, signal and they are uh, frequently exchanged when their nominal lifespan, lifespan is over and thereby there is, at, at least when I bought mine, there was one seller I think from China who bought them all and he even uh, tested the accuracy of them and you can get without any further calibration you get a precision of nine decimal figures so that that is I think absolutely enough to adjust any frequency counter or anything else so the first use of this is uh, just to adjust the crystal frequency for your frequency counter because if you only have uh, a normal cr normal crystal they only have a precision of about 50 ppm 50 parts per million which is way too much so if you're displaying six decimal figures the last two figures will be uncertain and they have not a good temperature uh, stability so the next best thing would be an oven controlled crystal oscillator an OCXO but also there you have the problem you first of all have to adjust the center frequency and where do you get a standard frequency from and another purpose where you need at least six valid decimal places 
uh, is to adjust the uh, clock crystal for, for quartz controlled clocks. Here I've brought a little miniature Nixie clock with Russian iron 17 Nixie tubes. I will give you the link down below. You can get this still including the tubes from eBay seller or from, from Nixie seller Cosbo.com. They are one of the smallest uh, Nixie tube, a little bit bigger than the ones uh, from my Nixie watch, which I have lying around here somewhere. Let's take a look. There it is. Here in comparison is my Nixie. No, they're even a little bit... Yeah, the, the Digitate is about the same, but of course uh, the used Nixie tube and the Nixie watch are much more beautiful. Uh, anyway, if you're interested in the uh, Nixie tube hobby, this is one of the cheapest and nicest uh, kits with a small Nixie tube. But uh, you have to adjust the quartz frequency to get a good precision so that you don't have to set the time uh, every two days. And here you can see there's a little capacity uh, trimmer just for hoops. That was the 160 volts that just bit me, or 175 volts. Uh, here you have a little capacity trimmer uh, just to adjust the frequency up to a few ppm's. Uh, so now what I want to demonstrate, uh, by the way, if you're interested in the physics of how a rubidium frequency standard works like, I will give you the links to an interesting video from David L. Jones from over at the EAV block who has uh, torn apart exactly one of those atomic clock packages, rubidium clock packages that I also use here inside. And now what I want to demonstrate you is uh, two things. First of all, a, a rubidium frequency standard takes some time to heat up. You can see here, here is a control LED, a PLL unlocked, uh, which means only when, when this LED turns off, then the uh, frequency is really, has really stabilized because there is a PLL inside which has a very, very long time constant that, that is necessary to give you nine valid digits. And you also can check the, the operating voltage, the, the crystal voltage. Well, you might think, why, why crystal voltage? That is because the frequency that you get out from the a rubidium clock is not the rubidium frequency itself divided down by some factor, but the ru rubidium frequency controls just a P PLL loop with a quartz. So the main frequency is really generated by a t usually a 10 megahertz quartz, but the PLL which controls the uh, quartz that is tied to the rubidium frequency, which is ranges in the gigahertz range, I think something around 5 gigahertz. And you can check the lamp voltage. Uh, that, what's meant by that is uh, the rubidium, there are some milligrams of it in an evacuated uh, glass uh, tube, and the rubidium is evapor evaporated. And the voltage that controls the heater, that, that is the lamp voltage. So that, that is just for checking if your rubidium frequency standard uh, is still inside its limits. Now, um, when I turn it on, we will see how long it takes uh, the frequency to stabilize until finally the LED for the PLL turns off. And the second thing is uh, I have um, adjusted this frequency counter, which can display up to nine valid uh, decimal places. Uh, I've adjusted it, I think, one and a half years ago, the last time, and we will just see then when the rubidium frequency standard has stabilized, how much it has went out of calibration after one and a half years, because even though it has a often controlled uh, quartz crystal, there is still some aging in every crystal and we will see how much this has been after one and a half years. So let's turn it on and see what we get. You see we are only now well above. We only have five valid decimal places and the frequency, now I've, I've turned on the frequency counter 
half an hour ago. So the um, crystal, uh, the oven controlled crystal oscillator has already stabilized. But you can see that the um, frequency now, as long as the PLL doesn't isn't in in lock mode, um, varies around for quite a large amount, and. I will probably speed up the video just to uh, just not to take too much of your time, but it takes just some time until we get a stable display. So you you see the the first time it was below 10 megahertz. Uh, now we are above, and uh, this will go down again below, and then. At some times, after a few minutes, it will stabilize at, uh, at its final value. So after stabilizing, after the PLL has locked, uh, you can see now with 2467 display decimals, we are exactly at 10 megahertz, or here it is displayed as 10,000 kilohertz. Anyway, if we increase the resolution, which then takes a longer gate time, we just have to wait. Now we are at eight decimal places and you can see it's not 100% exact. Now we have, I think, 10 seconds uh, gate time. So we have at least 10 to the minus one, two, three, four, five, six, three times 10 to the minus seven is the aging that has taken place because I've uh, adjusted the frequency to exactly 10.0000000 megahertz. We could still increase the displayed uh, digits to nine digit, but that takes now a very long uh, gate time. So I will also speed up the video again here. So after the gate time was over, uh, the final displayed value with the nine decimal places is uh, it's uh, out of uh, adjustment by um, um, 0.2 ppm. So um, th this is just enough for me. I will. Uh, when the camera is turned off, readjust it to zero, zero. But we can see we have a drift of 0.2 ppm in one and a half years. And that's quite okay for a, this is not a special crystal. It's a crystal just um, from a normal electronics distrib distributor. So not a special high quality quartz. And I'm quite content that after one and a half years, years we only have a drift of uh, 0.2 ppm. So this is anyway absolutely sufficient in accuracy to uh, check the accuracy of a quartz used in a clock because it makes no sense to try to adjust the uh, clock quartzes uh, to better than 1 ppm accuracy because the, uh, the temperature drift is usually much larger than 1 ppm per degree Celsius or per Kelvin. Ah, so let's change over to our little Nixie display, our Nixie clock, and adjust the frequency here. So first of all, what do you need when you want to adjust the uh, quartz frequency of a clock circuit? Of course, we have our calibrated frequency counter. Uh, now set to seven digits uh, displayed accuracy. And you need a special, well, one point in the circuit where you have to tap off a certain um, frequency uh, that is derived from the main quartz. You cannot probe at, directly at the quartz because the capacitance of your probe uh, just changes the frequency. So the clocks from uh, Cospo.com, they have the nice feature that you can set them into a special mode where on a special pin of the microcontroller you get a 200 kilohertz frequency which is derived here from the main 4 megahertz quartz. 
And the third thing you need is if you have a uh, variable capacitor here, a capacitor trimmer, uh, then you should have uh, one of these uh, ceramic screwdrivers because if you use metallic ones, just by touching it gives you an extra capacitance and you always have to wait until you uh, disconnect the, uh, the tip of the screwdriver from the capacitance trimmer. Uh, so, we see here without any adjustment, we are out uh, 11, uh, 11 parts in 2 millions, which means 5.5 ppm. Now let's try to tweak the frequency to as good as possible to 200 kilohertz. I always have to wait a little bit until the frequency counter has measured the new frequency. So we're getting lower and nearer down to 200.000. And now we're nearly there. So that is it. I could still go one step in resolution, one digit upwards, but this makes no sense uh, and I will show you in a second why it doesn't make any sense because if we put a little freeze dry uh, just to change the temperature of the quartz and wait for a second, you see we are way out now just to a change of temperature of course, it should go back to exactly 200 kilohertz. But the uh, temperature dependence of a normal, non-ovenized um, quartz is just too low. Uh, you usually have something in the range of, well, 5 to 20 ppm per degree Celsius. And you see it even doesn't return exactly uh, to the 200 kilohertz that we just adjusted. Might take some time longer. Yeah, it goes down now a little bit. Uh, so that's the way how to adjust. You need a precise adjusted uh, frequency counter. You need some point where you can tap off a frequency derived from the main quartz crystal. And you should have at best one of these ceramic screwdrivers if you have a capacitance trimmer. I've made a separate separate video about uh, these adjustment screwdrivers that are uh, really good for that purpose. And well, uh, just to give you an impression, one year has about 30 million seconds. So that means if we adjust to one ppm, one parts per million, your clock would be ideally of 30 seconds per year. So that would be quite good, but you will usually never reach this with a stand standard quartz because of the temperature dependency, except if you have a room where you have all year long the whole temperature. So that was it. And now let's take a look inside our rubidium frequency standard. So that's how it looks inside. Uh, this is the where the magic happens, um, the rubidium frequency standard. It's an Ephratom Alpro 101. Uh, you can find the data sheet uh, with Google without any problems. You can see I've written even the, um, the power supply and the control voltages here on the back just uh, because I don't have the data sheet always with me. Uh, so it needs the heater, heater needs uh, quite some voltage and current, 24 volts, 1.7 amps uh, during uh, heating. Uh, so that's why I need such a big chunky transformer here, which uh, delivers the necessary voltage and uh, current. Uh, the rest is straightforward. It, it looks quite ugly, I know, but uh, <clears throat> it wasn't made to show to other people, but just to work. Here you have a, a uh, connector where I've directly soldered all the voltage, all the wires for the output, the uh, supply voltage, etc. on. 
because uh, buying a getting a connector for this uh, special type was not very easy uh, so I directly soldered that onto it so and there's not much inside a fuse a mains filter the uh, uh, power supply for the for, for rectifying here the, the transformer output and putting some regulated 24 volts and the 5 volts for the logic and as you could, could see on the front I uh, with a, a 12 position rotary uh, switch I can uh, get not only 10 megahertz but also uh, divided down uh, frequencies like 1 megahertz 100 kilohertz etc 100 hertz 50 hertz 10 hertz down to 0.1 hertz so frequencies that you sometimes use in uh, in circuits that you build up but usually you only have the uh, you use the 10 megahertz for adjusting your frequency counter and uh, that was just built with uh, some um, dual decade counters or divider dividers let me look at what it is 74 hc 45 18 i think these are anyway these are uh, hc mos uh, dual bcd dividers or counters uh, so you can get from each counter you can uh, tap off a division by 10 or a division by 2 and they are all daisy chained so that in the end i can get down to uh, 0.1 hertz and they can drive directly here the 50 ohms uh, output so no problem at all and i think that was it so you can build easily one of your own you only need uh, a big chunky transformer and uh, you should use a regulated 24 volts output that's why here the uh, big heatsink is uh, four and you need not another five volts here for the uh, for the buffering and that was it so uh, you can get one of your own uh, from eBay and uh, it was never easier to get a uh, precision frequency standard with nine valid uh, digits uh, without any further adjustments so that was really a joy to have one and finally to adjust all of my frequency counters here in the lab and my frequency counters at home uh, just to know once and for all that they show really the correct frequency so thanks for watching if you liked it please give it a big thumbs up until next time, bye from Roger, bye from Kanka Labs.